Man like Robert Bruce. What's going on? I'm good, my brother. How are you, man? I'm fine, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Can everyone hear me all right? Give us a thumbs up if you can hear us both all good, man. Yeah, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. How's your Sunday been going, bro? Sunday's been cool. It's just been a relaxing Sunday. Sundays these days are very relaxing, you know? <laughs> like how Sunday really should be, man. trust me. <laughs> it's true. Easy. I've still been going into radio, though. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's your Sunday be? I see a bike ride and that. Yeah, no, basically, I'm trying to stay fit because when you're at home, you just go to the fridge all the time, innit? And you're just eating, eating, Honestly. eating. Honestly. And you expect yeah, something new to appear and there's nothing appearing. Yeah, there's nothing, bruv. So I just thought, <laughs> let me get on, this, um, on a running and a bike ride then, try and stay. Yeah. Do you know what's mad? What? Like, I'm in better shape than I was when I was going to gym, which is crazy. Are I don't you? know what I was doing in the gym, boy. But, yeah, <laughs> it's mad. It's mad. No, I've gone the other way. Like, this summer was meant to be my summer. It was meant to be beach, top off, everything. <laughs> But I don't know what's not happening. Happening. Not <laughs> no, happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Where can mm. we even start? Where can we even jump in? How do we describe you? A mentor, an author, a musician, award winner, world traveller. There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of words in there. But above all, an artist, first and mm. foremost. Governor B, everyone. If you're in the studio, I'll give you a big round of applause. We can do that, bro. We can do that. We can still do that, man. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well, man. Um, it's been amazing seeing how everyone's responded to that album and stuff. Obviously, it's, it's a weird time because I dropped it around the whole craziness around COVID-19 and stuff like that. Um, so it felt a bit weird, but I don't know. It felt like the messages on that album kind of suit the time we're in. So, yeah, it worked out, man. And I'm doing well. I'm just trying to stay optimistic because... Obviously, the summer's looking a lot different. No yeah, yeah, for you, yeah. No shows for me. <laughs> no shows mad, for you. Man. So, yeah, just trying to stay positive. Yeah. We're going to talk about the album anyway, but I wanted to get the overview of Governor B. How we got to where we are today? Because it's been a lot of years, you know? Yeah, it's true. It's man. been a long time. It's been a long time. It's weird. It feels like a flash, but when I look back, yeah, I've been doing this for the best part of a decade now. Um, yeah. Started just rapping in the playground at school. That like we used to have this thing called Rag Week. So everyone that could rap would just go Rag Week and join the MC competition. And I always yeah. used to do quite well. Um, and then, yeah, I just started it as a hobby, really. And then one of my mentors said, why don't you just, like, record an album just for the youth group that you go to? And yeah. See how it goes. And I did that. And there was probably about 70 people in my youth group. But on uh, the day of the album launch, like, 800 people turned up. Really? And then, Is that the narrow yeah, road, the first one? Yeah, the narrow road. The narrow yeah. road, Okay. So that's the album of, like, Kingdom Skank. Like, back in the day, bruv, old school tunes. That was around the time of, like, Bibles, Bibles, all that kind of stuff as yeah. well. And, um, yeah, it just went from there, really. That's when I How old were you? I was 17 slash 18 around that time. 17, 18. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah so, th- them times, Narrow Road, yeah? Did you know this is the career you wanted to pursue or it's still just a hobby? Because <clears throat> I wasn't making money from it, it still felt like a hobby. Yeah. Um, I thought, oh, if it works out, I want to be a rapper, definitely. But where my parents were like, solid, you have to go uni, finish uni, like, get a good job and stuff. Yeah. I never believed that it could actually happen. Okay. um, I don't know what the turning point was. It was probably like my mum giving me her blessing. I mean, the first mobile that I won, before that, she was like, you got to get a proper job, like, have a backup. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was What year was the first mobile? That was 2010. So, yeah. 2000. That's two years after Narrow Road, then. Yeah, two years after, man. What comes faith? Um, what comes first, the faith or the music? I think the faith is foundational because it shapes my worldview. Yeah. But uh, it's weird, man, because I feel like I was influenced a lot by the people around me. Mhm. So there's people that are artists that have faith, but it doesn't need to be all up in their music. Like, you might hear hints in it. Then you do your research, yeah. then you're like, oh, I swear he's got faith. But for me, I just feel like out of the gate, because of the people that I was around, the vibe I was around, I thought, you know what, I'm going all in. It's got to be in the music. So, yeah, the faith definitely came first, man. The faith came first. I'm not going to lie to you. I've listened to all of the projects today from start oh, to finish, oh, except oh. for one. Yeah, I've listened to all of them. I There's a couple. Few songs, bro. But... <laughs> a few of the songs are suspect, bro. We're going to get into the songs. But that narrow road, though, that was straight up. That was like 
hard hitting. When I'm listening to that, I'm thinking, oh, this is the guy that's going to stop me on the street. When I walk in the yeah, house, the message was clear. Like, I was on one, I'm not going to lie. You know, like the mm-hmm. first time that you like find faith and you, I don't know, like some people might be able to relate. There's this transformation that takes place. And then you just mm-hmm. want to tell everyone about it. You're just mad excited, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel like I had all that excitement, but not a lot of wisdom in how I was delivering it. So if you listen to the narrow road, you might think, right, this guy's like, yeah, judgmental. <laughs> that, bro. You know what I mean? But yeah, man, that's, that's what growth is about. Do you know what I mean? You live, you learn, you find better ways to convey your messages. And yeah, but narrow road was definitely, I'm thankful because it did a lot for me. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I can imagine. I can imagine. And at that point, did you know, all right, for all of my career, this is the message I want to push? Or again, it was just all around you? I definitely had like a conviction that when you put mm-hmm. pen to paper, you need to be filling people with inspiration and hope. Obviously, I get my hope from my faith, but my music's not exclusive. Like, you can't only listen to it if you've got faith. If you mm-hmm. haven't got faith, but you're in a bad situation, I want you to be able to listen and feel like, you know what, there's light at the end of the tunnel and I can fight another day. But yeah, I've definitely got a conviction that I need to have faith-filled lyrics that inspire people, man. From early as well. What was the music scene like at that time? Who was around you? What was that? Because to be honest, Governor B, in the Christian music scene, you're yeah. a superstar. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, you're a, bit, you're a big deal. At least any... Hey, one second, hold on. Someone's yeah. going to disconnect my phone from my car. I'm just going to do that real quick. Oh, is that what it's connected to? Yeah, man. I was banging some music. Are we off? Yeah. Hello? Yo, we are? Yeah, we yeah, don't want no situation like them man yesterday at all. <laughs> you got Teddy Riley in that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> man popped out of a live band, you know? I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I've seen all of the reactions today. Crazy, bro. Can everyone hear um, all right? I can hear an echo of myself, but can everyone else hear all right? Yeah, is it better now? Is it better? You're like the baby face of this conversation, bro. Who, me? <laughs> all right, cool. They said it's way better. Cool. It's um, way better. Perfect, I can't even remember perfect. what I was saying, but... I was saying music scene at that time. One, what was the UK music scene like? So who was you looking to? Who was your inspirations and stuff? And then what was happening in your world? So, like, my biggest inspiration and a lot of my fans will know this, was Kano, because he lived, like, 15 minutes away from me. So I'm from Cannon Town, yeah? Kano's, like, mm-hmm. East Ham. So it's very close, do you know what I'm saying? But then I'm switching on MTV Bass, and I'm seeing P's and Q's on the TV, and him doing mad things. Obviously, Dizzy Rascal's a staple of the, the genre that I'm involved in, and he was sick. Yeah. But for me, Kano was around the corner. Um, so, yeah, my first relationship with music was me like writing down the bars to like Kano's radio sets and P's and Q's and that then mm. spitting them back to myself and that um, so that was my biggest inspiration but obviously you had like Rough Squad like Wiley uh, Dizzy Rascal <coughs> JME everyone around that whole grime scene but at the same time it was like Kirk Franklin Mary Mary like Alvin Slaughter because that's what my parents were playing so it was like mm. gospel and grime um, and then in my world I'd say, like, the Wiley was a guy called yeah. LW, yeah? And he, like, okay, yeah, brought yeah. me through, bro. Like, he brought me through and said, rah, you're sick, like, took me to Bear Shows and that and was just, like, up for getting me on stage. There was a group called Commission that was sick. Basically, everyone that was on um, Bibles, Bibles, which was, like, a big channel yeah. you hit at the time. So, um, yeah, man, that was the influences around the time. All right, then, cool. And, like, with that say like the bibles bibles crew was your mm. infrastructure good like was you doing going around churches doing the church tours and stuff like that what was it like then there was bare events not really too many in the churches well no a couple yeah but there was like events that people would put on themselves so like lw would put yeah. on his event or commission would have his um their, their album launch vic Tizzle would have his album launch at oceans or something like bare people would roll down there yeah. i'd do mine so there was like a little microcosm of these artists just doing their own thing. Like I'm not gonna lie, it was sick, bro. Like there's not a lot of them in yeah. now, but <laughs> it was hard. And for me, that was like my practice hours. Do you know what I'm saying? That was me going on mm. stage with like boot cut jeans, not holding the mic properly, like missing the drop. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah, man. 
So you're still around, like, this is between 17 to, say, 20 mm. right now. What are the parents saying? First of all, are they trying to, like, do they understand what you're doing? Because you're rapping, but it's gospel yeah. as well. How, had that barrier been broken yet? Yeah, they rated it, yeah. Both yeah. my mum and dad rated it, but they didn't rate it above the normal things that was expected of me, like going to uni and getting a qualification mm. and getting a good job. So I remember I'd be like, mum, I'm just going like Manchester. I'm just going Birmingham. She'd be like, yeah. hey, Manchester, Birmingham, <laughs> brother. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so they rated it, but not too much. Not too much. Yeah. Until um until they started seeing results and then like their friends were saying, oh, like I saw um governor on TV or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, man. Talking about results, what leads to the first MOBO then? Um, is it off the back of Narrow Road type. or Scrapbook at that point? So it's probably just off the back of Scrapbook. So Narrow yeah. Road had happened. Scrapbook was and 2011? Then... No, wait. Okay, no, yeah. no, it wasn't. Because Scrapbook was 2011, Before, yeah. I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it was just off the back of Narrow Road. And Kingdom Skag was like the big like song from that album, man. So, yeah, that made a lot of noise. And I think that made them take notice. But I was, I was so dumb, yeah. bro. Like, why, I got why? quite a bit of money, yeah, for someone that's 17, 18 years old. And I should have done a video for Kingdom Skank, but I didn't, bruv. I went to Stratford and I just started spending peas on clothes. <laughs> Mad. <laughs> but yeah, if I did a video, it I think happens. It a bit bigger, but it happens, man. You live and you learn. You live and you learn for sure. So then the family recognised the MOBO then? Yeah, 100%. Because yeah. them times, MOBO was on BBC, innit? Not even like BBC mm. Free. Wait, what was it on? BBC Three was on TV back then, didn't it? But yeah, BBC it was, three was on BBC Three or BBC Two or something like that, or the replay was on yeah. BBC Two. So they're not even having to like go on the internet or search deeper. It's just there, yeah, get yeah. me. <laughs> and so when um when Reggie Yates gave me the award and that, I think that's when my mum flipped. Thought, yeah, okay, decent. You know what I'm saying? Serious. Maybe she thought had the more money for now. You as well. Huh? Had the switch turned for you as well? Yeah, man. Because obviously. You're in a room with, I don't know, man, whoever the who's who were them times, like Professor Green, mm-hmm. Tiny Temper, like everyone that you grew up listening to, everyone that you respect. So it increases your hunger. And I'm like, I'm just a guy that started rapping as a hobby and just talking about my faith, trying to inspire people. And I'm in the same rooms as these guys. So maybe I can do something that no one mm. from my world has ever done before. I saw someone in the comments say, what did you buy at Stratford? Ah, it's proper embarrassing, man. But, um, Go on. <laughs> before Westlord, yeah? Do you remember that? Yeah. The Stratford in shops? Yeah, 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 yeah. But there's Stratford in shops, and there's this guy, yeah, that sells fake, like, Nike track suits, Adidas track suits, Air Max 95s and that, yeah? So I thought, ah, oh, if I buy, like, one Air Max 95, that's, like, a 120, 130, yeah? Yeah. But if I buy fake ones, they're like forty pounds each, so I can get three pairs for the price of one. So I just bought bare <laughs> fake track suits, bare fake Air Max ninety fives, ninety sevens. Yeah, I bought out yeah. still. That's all we know at that time, man. <laughs> got some done. They got Stratford in shops though. Real too. All right, moving forward then. Scrapbook comes out. What's the whole? You went uni, obviously. Hey, right, but people are you... judging me. Yeah, I'm not wearing what? fake trainers <laughs> going forward. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I've changed now. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, so it doesn't even matter. Who to know if you are or not? We're going to have to take your word for it. Because you've got history. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> so you do the uni thing then? Yeah, so I go uni. I went to University of Hertfordshire. Uh, my first year, I studied computer science. It wasn't really yeah. for me. But I didn't clock until the end of the year. And I got my results. <laughs> so then I to... What were the results saying? Subject. What were the results saying? Uh, it's a bit mad. I think the letter... What did the letter say? You know them letters that's like, oh, thank you for attending this year. There's not even a grade on it or anything like that. It's like one of them ones. Mm. And then I thought, yeah, I need to switch it up because another three years, it's a bit Patience sticky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but trust me. So I moved to business. So what did you do? Yeah. I moved to business and journalism. And then that meant that I had to stay another three years. So I think my total time at uni was four years, maybe four and a half. I can't even remember, bro. Just know that uni <laughs> wasn't for me, bro. So what year did you graduate then? 
I graduated, like, bro. Yeah, bro I can't lie. The questions are a bit icky, sticky right now, bro. <laughs> <laughs> just no, just no man graduated, did it? <laughs> yeah. No, I got a two two. I got a two two. Man graduated, bro. Don't worry, it's all right, man. It's all good. But are you doing what I'm basically trying to get? At? Are you doing music at the same time? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was doing music at the same time, which might have might explain my results. Um, but I was getting hard with the okay. music, man. Like I was, I had this little Renault Clio that I bought off my boy, my one of my best friends, Joe, and uh, that's where I take to all my shows, man. Um, from Hertfordshire, so I go London, I go Birmingham, I go Manchester, I go Liverpool, um, and then come back to uni and just roll semesters and that, man. Mm. I mean, roll to classes and that. Um, but yeah, I was doing it at the same time. I never gave up the dream. Because it's like, when you win the MOBO, you're, it's like you're so close. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like it's yeah, working. Yeah. So I need to keep going. I don't want to lose momentum. So, yeah. You've definitely had momentum because you've put out lots of projects. Right? Especially between 2013 to 2015, there's like Odd One Out, um, mm. Scrapbook 2, Secret Worlds at the end of it. What was the one in the middle of that? Uh, did Something for the summer. 40. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something well, for the summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something for the summer, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I was just banging out bare content. And the reason why in 2015 it slowed down a little bit is because my boys were just honest with me and they said, you're a hard worker, but the quality control on your albums is really? not the one. Yeah. So really? Imagine I'm putting out like, yeah, I think Scrapbook was like 20 songs. Like One of them was like two. one hour, 22 minutes. Trust me, bro. Like, this One hour been A-side, B-side. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, bro. And, bro, if you have a one hour 22 project, yeah, not every song is going to be good. It's hard, bro. <laughs> so the man them, shout out to Jake, Nick, Barney. We've got this WhatsApp group. And, bro, they called Scrapbook 2 Crapbook Poo in the WhatsApp group, yeah? Oh. That's, how, that's how real it got. And I was like, yo... <laughs> Man needs to look at this quality control. So from then, I just slowed down and tried to make every song mean something, man, and just take my time. Mm -hmm. When I look at, like, Odd One Out, because of the style of music you was making, did you feel like the Odd One Out? Yeah, definitely, man. And I think I had this, this chip on my shoulder that everyone thinks I'm different, mm -hmm. so I'm going to talk about it. So, like, yeah. Odd One Out, even Secret World, names like that, it just singles me out. And she says to everyone, I know that you think I'm different. Um, and let's not hide the elephant in the room, but I'm just going to be me and try my best. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But then on the flip side, like you're killing it in the sort of Christian gospel world as well. Them times you're doing festivals in the summer and stuff like that. Yeah, man. So Secret World is a little bit about that. There's like a world that people don't really know about where, imagine I was doing like, I did a festival in Slovakia to 8,000 people, yeah? One called yeah. Campfest. And it's like, bro, people only know about, like, Glastonbury, wireless, do you get me? They don't know that stuff like that's mm -hmm. going down. Um, so in my little world, I'm doing very well, but at the same time, I can walk down any street and no one's going to know who I am. Or in the grand world, no one's really rating me. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but I think I grew to be satisfied about that, man. And like, you know what? This is mm -hmm. the world that I'm in. Let me just embrace it. Yeah, no, nah, he for real. What sort of um, jobs on the side were you doing at those times? So my first job. Where did you was, work? Uh, yeah, Primark in Lakeside. I was at the in the ladies department, and my job was yeah. to restock the lingerie. And that's when I clocked that. <laughs> Ladies are savage, bruv, because they'll just pick up a pair of knickers and then just dash it, bruv. And then, that's, uh... and then after that, I worked in a call centre in Brentwood selling Omega free products to people. I had to cold call mm -hmm. people. Um, and that was all right. And then my last job was at the O2 phone shop in Romford. Um, and yeah, I had beef with the manager, so I had to leave, man. It was peak still. What beef? What beef? What do you do, Tim? Basically, we had targets here that we had to reach. So we had to sell yeah. a certain number of, like, iPhones um, in a week. And I was low on my target that week. But then an old lady came in, and she don't really need an iPhone, bruv, because she's not going on the yeah. internet. She just needs, like, a Nokia or something. So I sold her yeah. a Nokia. Then he said, why didn't you sell her the iPhone? I was like, bruv, she don't know how to use Safari and, and all them things. <laughs> and then he just got rude. So I said, you know what? I'm done, man. 
And then, yeah, that yeah. was the last job I had. And there's hey, been music ever since? Yeah, it's been music ever since, thankfully. One of my boys challenged me, man, a guy called Jake Isaac, and he was like, look, if you just go for it and then have faith, like, it will work out. And if it doesn't, at least you tried. So I just decided to give it my all. And thankfully, man, it worked out. And then are you experimenting with different styles? Because our careers cross paths when you put out Chale, the Afrobeats influence track. And we premiered yeah. it on our student radio show. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that time ago. Do you remember? Yeah, Trust yeah, me, yeah. Bro. That was a while ago. Yeah, you've been, you've been saying so lots of times, you... though. A little while now. <laughs> right. A little while. So then what do you think about like experimenting with sounds at that time? Because obviously the musical sound now today is different. What was the landscape yeah. in that 2013 to 2015? So them times, how Chale came about is I had never really embraced my Ghanaian side, yeah? So my family are Ghanaian. Mm-hmm. And at that time, you know, back in the day, if you were African and you went to like primary school, you're not cool, bruv. Everyone's like taking no, a lick no, out no. of you, like calling you an African bum scratcher, like all these things. Um, but now for the youths, it's different. Like they can be proud that they're African and everyone respects it. And around that time, I don't know if you remember, but Fuse ODG was killing it, bro. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Everything he dropped was just going mad. They started with the Azonto song, then he just went. And I thought, bro, man's gone AMP, you know, let me get a little bit of this, this Afrobeat thing. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was me and G Kid, man. But I love that tune. I, hate, I like it as well. Bro. I think you should have come back with the Afro now. Yeah, it needs to be in the right way, though, man. You know what I'm saying? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people are killing it right now. But um yeah. Everything I do now I feel just has to be true and authentic rather than just copying yeah. like a wave. I think Jay Z said something that really stuck with me. And he was like, Oh, would you rather be a trend or Ralph Lauren? And I thought, Yeah, that's actually true that like, there's so many different trends and stuff, but I just wanna make true art, man, and hopefully it will stand the test of time. Yeah, and have you had to sort of stick to your guns like even with tracks, I think do it like that. People have always advised you on what you should do to progress your career. How did you manage to keep you within that? The the real answer is that I tried to listen to that advice and it didn't work. Yeah. And I've oh, realized real. that there's there's no formula, bro. Like you can't tell me do exactly what Stormzy did and then you're gonna do well. Because what worked for him is not gonna work for me. Everyone's different. Um, so I feel like I just tried to do different things like make songs for the radio so I sampled like a song called uh, Free by Ultranate thinking right yeah. this is my radio that's hit, the right? one yeah. I've got a radio saga I've paid him a lot of money and I think man got one play bruv on like Cardiff <laughs> FM or something like that bruv. Yeah. and I was like ah oh, I was burning bruv and then I just got to a point where I'm just like I'm going to make what I make man and whoever likes it likes it and just focus on the lyrics and connecting with like my fans that actually like me and hopefully things will happen off the back of that. We spoke about Secret World a little bit and one of the big mm. moments of that tape was your live show. I think I was there as well. You brought up Michelle Williams at your live show. Yeah. Yeah. How big of a moment was that for you? Like what is, what's the backstory on that from Secret World to Michelle Williams at the show? Uh, so Michelle Williams, we started talking over social media just like mutual respect obviously goes without saying the other than maybe the Spice Girls she's in the biggest girl group in the world do you know what I'm saying in Destiny's yeah. Child um, so she was just a sick individual man and obviously she's always been like part a little bit because like she's Michelle and then obviously chicks yeah. up Michelle rhythm and that but I was just like bruv you're sick man do you know what I'm saying like you've achieved only like what a lot of people would dream to achieve um and then she happened to be in london during the time of the show so i was like oh do you know if like would you mind coming out because she had the big hit say yes <laughs> yeah with beyonce yeah. and kelly Rowland. so i was like mm-hmm. can you come do say yes at my show thinking bro this is just like o2 academy not even a big room the small room bro you yeah. know what I'm saying like 300 people it's islington i think she said, yeah islington yeah and she said yeah come um so she just rolled through and this is when I knew she was a big deal, yeah? She was like, um, yeah, don't worry about sorting me out or anything. The only thing I need is security. So I was like, all right, cool, say nothing. <laughs> so my boy is like a security guard. So I bowed him. I was like, bro, you need to come down to the show, Mr. Williams. He said, who? Did he come with a badge in that? 
Bro, he came with a little the debit card on the side, bro, and everything. Yeah. Proper thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, that was a that was a moment, and that started like me bringing out people at shows and that. So like the next one, like Michael Dapper came out, Sam Henshaw, and I don't know, it's sick, man. Mm. When artists like support each other at other people's shows, man, it was wavy. And it's cool that you're getting embraced by people as well. Like even the names that you mentioned for so mm. long being the odd one out. It's like people are embracing you now, which is wicked as well, man. How many of your sort of role models and musical influences that you looked up to have you even mm. worked with or shared stages with at this point? Bro, it's mad, man. I'm so grateful. I was looking back the other day, even like my parents' parents, is my parents' role models and people that they listen to, yeah. like I've been able to work with. So like Joyce Lynn Brown, I done a song with like a few years ago. Um, obviously, Rich is just a goat, bro. In my opinion, mm -hmm. um, getting to work with him was cool. Sam Henshaw, um, Shell Williams, Lecrae, Andy Minio, bare people, bro, man, bare people. Like, and it's mad because, like I said, I've been doing this for a while and always felt like I was a bit of a black sheep. But um, yeah, I get guess it just works out, man. I've got this theory that if yeah. you're good enough for long enough, people will start to take note. But a lot of the times you mm. can, like, give up before, like, really, really persevering. So, yeah, man. Obviously, Nick Brewer as well, like, one of my role models, you know what I'm saying? And I used to work with him. <laughs> we hear that. Big up Nick, man. Big up Nick. <laughs> um, big life change for you as well, just before Secret World. Marriage, mm. bro. You get yeah. married. Yeah, man. How is that process for you? Even, like, being a rapper, you're getting married, like... You're seen as this person. Now you're gonna have to bring sort of your other half into your world like that. What was yeah. going through your mind? I'm not gonna lie, man. Like it's tough. Obviously, people see like the the wedding day and like the pictures and that kind of stuff, and they think, "Oh, sick." But you gotta really work at it, man. Um, and one of my weaknesses or failures is I'm a really bad communicator. So I'm used to just being like, "Mum." I'm going out and she don't know where I am. I forget to tell her what time I'm coming home, blah, blah, blah. When you try and do life with another person, that kind of stuff causes big, big problems. So you've got to try your best to really, really work at it. And I'm not even the best I can be yet, but I'm thankful that I'm not who I was yesterday. Do you get what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. the toughest thing is waking up and not being able to just do what you do. You've got to think about someone else, you know what I'm saying? Or think about how they feel first. Um, so, yeah, it's hard, man. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort. But I guess all you can do is try your best, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Did you feel any pressure in your career in terms of, oh, I've got responsibility now, sort of thing? Yeah, in a sense that if I give my all to music and it doesn't work out, only I am sleeping on the streets. You get me? Mm. But now, it's a couple people <laughs> sleeping on the streets. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I definitely felt the pressure to, like, really, really push myself. And I'm hard on myself, man. Um, and I try to work out. I, they got my mum in a chat, you know? It's mad right is, now. Is she, is she, is she here? <laughs> yeah, I forgot to block her for my life, man. <laughs> Don't worry. It's all good stuff, man. It's all good stuff. <laughs> So, yeah, no, that is a little bit of added pressure. I had a question for you. What mm. soup have you cooked since you've been married? Because in Narrow Road, what I'm looking for, you were saying the man them sometimes have to cook plantain and soup, not always the women that have to cook. So what have you done? What food have you put to the table? I, I can't lie. Yeah, techie still. Uh, I think I'll cook like a little, a little British thing, a little chicken and leek. Yeah, you know I mean? A little chicken and leek, <laughs> chicken and leek soup. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but I've cooked plantain, though, and beans as well. And the beans. Beans soup. Yeah. The soup, we need to work on the soup thing. Okay, yeah. Because <laughs> the chicken and leek ain't really cutting it. I need the proper <laughs> African soup, do you know what I mean? So, um, but I've been doing the plantain and beans thing. Okay, then, cool. Everyone, make sure you go check out that song, What I'm Looking For, The Narrow Road. Nah, don't, don't check out that song. <laughs> Good. Um, you're, a set up, you're a set up guy, bro. <laughs> Try to set mine up. I told you I listened to everything. Right, I'm doing peanut soup next week, and I'm gonna send you. A, I'm gonna screenshot send a picture. A picture. Please put it up. We want to see the evidence. We want to see the evidence. I want to hear the review as well. 
Yeah, the review <laughs> might be a bit mad. So 2015, you get married, Secret World comes out, and then your next project is Hands Are Made For Working, right? Yeah, man. So you go through a major life change, a big thing happens in your family in terms of you lose your dad in that time period. Yeah, 100%. What was going through your mind? First of all, what was your plan for that time period? And then when your dad passed, what happened with you? So I had an album that was like half recorded. We were just sending demos back and forth. And it was going in a good direction. And if I'm honest, it was probably the same kind of content as Secret World. Um, mm-hmm. And then when I lost my dad, that was like the first person super close to me that I've ever lost. The first time I really experienced um, like grief. I'd lost my grandma and stuff, but because she lives in Ghana, there's like an element of disconnect, disconnect. there. Yeah. Um, so my dad hit me hard, man. And I think the months that followed were months of just like, just depression, um, Obviously, I'm the eldest child as well, so I felt like I had to really look after my mum. I had to make sure my brother was good, because my brother's a bit like me. We don't talk loads, you know what I'm saying? So I just wanted to make sure he wasn't suffering in silence. Um, And I didn't really care about music for a few months. Um, And then I had the opportunity to go go on a tour in America that had already been booked from before um, with a guy called Matt Redman. And he just kind of was like a just like an older brother figure to me and then really looked out for me, helped me a lot. And I felt that I needed to start writing how I was feeling. It was my wife actually that gave me the idea. And the lyrics just started coming so easy, bro. Like the first song was Carry On. Yeah, and that's one of the that... most powerful yeah. openings to the album I think mm. I've ever listened to. Yeah, thank you, man. I So I didn't even know that people would hear the songs. It was more for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I just had this conviction. And when you lose someone as close to you, you don't fear death as much because you're like, yeah, bro, like, I feel like if I die now, like, I'm ready, bro. Like, I've seen a dead body, someone that's close mm-hmm. to me. Like, all the stuff that I used to think was important, like, making songs for a certain audience and that stuff. Like, I don't care. I don't care what people think about me no more. So let me just put out what's real and honest to me. And that's what Hands Are Made For Working was. Um, and yeah, people liked it, man, thankfully. It definitely yeah. was a turning point, I think, in terms of the connection between me and the people that listen to my music. And that's one thing that you've done, because you've always told your story up front. Because you've, like, stood for something in your music, mm. there's been no way that you can sort of hide your life in songs, if that makes sense. No. Nah. So then this was a, another big life thing that's happened. How did you feel about putting it out there? Like, did you battle with yourself? I did at a point, but then once I got over that, I just had this inner conviction that this is art in its truest form, and I owe it to myself, and I owe it to my dad to put this out. And I spoke to bear of my friends, man, and one of my close friends, his name's Jordan, he said to me, like, because I'm a man of faith, every time I send him a song, it feels like every song needs to have a happy ending. But he's mm. like your Monday might not have a happy ending. Like, your Tuesday might not have a happy ending. And it's fine to leave it there. Um, and that just really spoke to me. And hands are made for working. Like, not every song has got a happy ending. Do you know what I mean? Like, carry on. But maybe further along in the album, I don't know, like, King of My Heart or Summer in the Streets, like, those songs have happy endings. So, yeah, yeah, I just felt like a freedom because the people that know me the best and the people that care about me said, you know what, I think this is the right thing to do as well. So, that helped, man. I feel like the freedom in the music comes through as well because we'll talk about like faith in a minute, but mm. there's always going to be that battle of your own personal faith. And then for someone like you, it's even harder because your personal faith is in front of the world sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So other definitely. people can go off the rails in their quiet time, mm. but it's almost like a part of you has to hold yourself up to what you stood for all this time. So then you have songs like Cast Your Cares. Does your faith dynamic change in that time in terms of your relationship with God? Uh, Yeah, definitely. I think my relationship with God struggled a lot because I had a lot of questions, which you can hear through the album. Like I was very angry at God and I felt guilty because I grew up Mm -hmm. in an environment where you couldn't really question God. You couldn't really question if things went wrong. But for me, I was on a thing where if I can't question, I don't know if this is for me. And so I was really like, battling my faith and stuff 
thankfully got to the point where I was like, was big enough to deal with my doubt and my insecurities. But my faith definitely changed. And you're right, man. It's hard living it out in front of the world and just being honest, mm. saying to people like, like, I'm struggling right now or whatever. And so for me, Hands Are Made For Working was a really honest album. And that's also why I've got empathy for other people, man. You know, like when like a Justin Bieber messes up or he says he's a Christian and everyone's just like jumping on him. I'm yeah. like, bro, like half of you lot can live that out in your private time, but he's trying to work stuff out in public. So mm. then I think like my empathy really grew in that period. I hear you. And then working towards the end of that album, Summer in the Streets, how do you get to that to even put any ounce of upbeatness and happiness on the album sort of thing? So I got this CD in my car. Is it in here at the moment? Oh, it's not. Um, but it's my dad's. He had this mix CD that some DJ did for him, innit? And it was yeah. full of, like, hip life and, like, disco songs. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one called Summer in the Streets that was on there. And the skanks that my dad used to bust out to this CD were different, bro. <laughs> so I had an idea to sample one of his favourite songs. It wasn't even that popular. Maybe it was to a certain demographic or whatever. Um, it's by Carrie Walker, the original. It's a little disco vibe. Um, and yeah, I just felt like this immense sense of joy that I'm going to see him one day um, mm. in heaven. And I don't know, people think heaven is just like singing to God. And I, I, I think I disagree. I feel like they're going to be able to do some of the stuff you do now, but it will just yeah. be in like an environment where there's like no darkness and no evil and that kind of stuff. And I just imagine me and my dad chilling in heaven, bro. Um, mm. and my friend Daisy who passed away as well and yeah I just thought let me just finish on like an upbeat one because I know this is not the end do you get me yeah yeah mm. and th that helped that whole album person's help by the time it was out how far healed was you or um, was there still process to go at that point yeah man I don't even think I'm fully healed now I just feel like I'm better at like I'm more used to how life is now do you know what I'm saying yeah. but at the time I put out the album I was still hurting a lot, but the album was like therapy for me. Mm -hmm. um, and just like, even like touring the album, we only did like a three day tour in London, Birmingham, Manchester. But just seeing how much the songs helped people that had been through similar things, bro, it was so mad, bro. And then mm -hmm. I realized that there's purpose in this. Like I can speak to people um, about their situations and they can feel like someone understands. And mm -hmm. I enjoyed doing that. And I thought like, you know what, bro? This is flipping sick, bro. Like, I'm glad I did this. Yeah. No, I hear you. My sister passed away the year before. And listening mm. to the album, it's like, oh, I wish I had an album like that at that time to listen to sort of thing. Yeah. So, like, man. you doing your thing is very important. Yeah. It's sort love of the curse of the artist sort of thing. You've got to be up front. What's your relationship man. with your fans like? It's, bro, like, after the album, it's different, like... I didn't realise how many people, not have just like lost people that are close to them, but mm. I just feel like they've, they're dealing with loss, like the loss of a job or loss of a career or loss of how they think their, their family set up would be. Like, it just connected us on a deeper level. But a lot of my fans, bro, they've been riding with me for like a long time, bro. Long time. Yeah. Um, and I think that like, Kingdom Skank had a bit to do with that, but I think it's more about what I stand for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for me, that wasn't always the best thing as a musician because mm. I wanted to be liked for the music. Do you get me? And I feel like since Hands Are Made For Working, my fans like me for the music more, more. and they like what I stand for. So it, it matches up. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I think so know. anyway. Maybe they think different. You don't let me know, innit? Yeah, <laughs> let us know in the comments here. Yeah? We're going to mm. talk about the new album in a minute, but I wanted to know from you... What do you think is the biggest misconception about Governor V? The biggest misconception? Or what shocks people the most when they meet you? Bro, do you hear the way I just said misconception, bro? My English is out mad. of the window right now, bro. Um, it was a bit mad. I thought we just put it down to signal. <laughs> the biggest misconception, which I think is changing a little bit, is that I just, I'm in this gospel box. But when I look at my life and my influences, the music that I love, I feel like it's just gram and hip hop, bro. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and rap. I remember one time I was asked to do this thing by a big radio station that heard a song. No, no, what song was it? I can't even remember what the song was. And they were like, "Can you go um, Newcastle and perform on this estate for some people?" And I was like, "Yeah, come." 
and I was gassed because it was like a really big radio station. Then the day after, mm. they called me and said, oh, you can't really go. Sorry, man. The director of the station just found out, like, you're a gospel artist. And I'm like, bruv, oh, like, really? like, you like the tune, bro. Like, the term yeah. or whatever I'm called, it's just semantics, really. But, yeah, the biggest misconception is that I just belong in this one box. But I think with this album and having, like, that Barney artist on here, Rich, Ezra Collective, kind of shows that um, I just think the music is good enough on its own. And if you like it, you like it. It doesn't matter what box you think I should be in. Mm. Let's talk about the album then. Everywhere I know. I said, hands are made for working. The intro, one of the mm. best. One of the most yeah, yeah. one of those deep. Everywhere I know has given it a run for its money, you know. <laughs> Bittersweet. Yeah, bro. <laughs> it's man. given it a run for its money, man. Yeah, talk man. to me about that. Like, let's talk about the first track and then we'll break down the album a little bit. So that first track is me two and a half years on from my dad. So I'm not fully healed, but I'm in a better place than I was for Carry On. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there's loads of good things that are happening in my, in my life. Like I bought a house, like I'm having a son, like all this kind of stuff. But then I still look at a photo of my dad and I feel emotional or whatever. So I'm not all the way out of the tunnel, but I'm further along. And so, yeah, it was just that thing of being in two places at one time. On a Monday, I'm happy. Like, I've just got the keys to my yard. And things are going well. On a Tuesday, I'm like, bro, like, I'm moving furniture into the yard and my dad's not even here to see this. Like, it's crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then on another day, I'm winning another mobile award or whatever. God, thank you so much. And then on another day, I'm just feeling down and depressed and, like, no one understands me. I'm having an argument with my wifey, like, uh, I don't know, whatever, like, it's it's mad. And I'm like, bro, I'm literally, I don't know what it's going to be on whatever day. Like, I'm in two places yeah. at the same time. And so that's how it came out, man. I just feel like my best tunes are when I'm just free and the real, man. When you, and you said people connect with pain. People definitely connect with real as well. Mm. Because when, I feel like as an artist, you're being an expression for loads of people that haven't got that outlet to express themselves. So yeah. when you hit the real, it's definitely going to connect. You know what I mean? Yeah, someone said that the other day, man, which was the biggest compliment I received. He was like, um, listening to my album, I spoke for him when he didn't have any words. And I was mm. like, bro, man, that's powerful. Very powerful, man. Very. Mm. How long did this album take to write? What was the the first session was like the 9th of January 2019 or something like that. So it was about a year. Yeah, it was about a year, which is quite good for me, man. Um, it felt like it flowed quite well. Obviously, yeah. some tracks take, took a while because I'm trying to sing on With Me All Along and that kind of stuff. <laughs> like, way, I'm not sounding too good right now, bro. So we need about 10 versions with this one. But yeah, about a year. About a year, so. And then you come out the gate with Mazza's the first one that drops in it. Mm. What's the energy? Why do you want to come out with that energy? Describe I always want to come out strong. Yeah. I always want to come out strong. So the beat has to be strong. The bars have to be strong. So the hands are made for working it with every day that I come up with first. This one, Mazza, because, you know, like, you can pull up to the dance, like, you can walk to the dance and just make a yeah. quiet entry, or you can get a little bus, get off. But when you pull up and you stir, yeah? yeah. People are like, all right, <laughs> like you man's, hurt. man's here, you get me? And, yeah, I think the first track from every project, I want people to know that, yeah, I'm here and I'm not playing, like, I've got something to say. Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. people that ain't listened to this album or they've just come across it for the first time, what is this album about? Everywhere and nowhere. So it was inspired by a photographer called Vivian Mayer. Um, and she lived in New York, took pictures everywhere she went, but she never got them developed. And when she died in 2009, the person that took over her studio found all these pictures, got them developed, and bro, they were the sickest pictures, sent them to a few galleries. And the gallery says, yo, this is amazing. And she's become one of the biggest modern photographers of this day, man. Um, but she wasn't alive to see that happen. Mm. So that's when I got her name everywhere I know her. She was everywhere, but at the same time, no one knew who she was. How does that relate to me? Well, my dad's nowhere to be seen, but his memories are still everywhere. God says he's with me, but he's invisible. I can't see him. Um, yeah. And even me as an artist, I've been doing this for 10 years. People stop me in the street. Yo, you're sick, blah, blah, blah. 
but still obviously man got the playlist right now on extra but before that <laughs> yeah. before that still no radio still not getting certain looks so yeah i just felt like i was in those two places at the same time what's the radio success like now because there's been a few from this one battle yeah. i heard everywhere mm. obviously your one with has just been playlisted as well mm. what's it been like breaking that barrier and do you feel like you're accepted in the mainstream um I feel like I am in a way because I feel like when you talk about positive lyricism from our scene, not to be big headed, but I would like to think that my name comes up with mm. the likes of Wretch, with the likes of Akala, with the likes of George the Poet, hopefully, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like there is an element of acceptance there. With me, the radio success this time just felt really satisfying because I know that I could have given up. Like I know that I could have put my foot off the pedal but I just kept going not for the radio but for my fans and for people that needed to hear the music and it's been accepted so for me that's like not even just for me I can look at people and say yo whatever you're working towards don't give up bro like Mm. there was a point I thought nah I'm never gonna get paid on run extra bro like never gonna get paid on capital extra do you know what I'm saying and thank you for playing me and stuff like that and thanks to everyone that is but yeah it's just one for perseverance and stay in the path bro Someone said that track with Wretch was special. Talk to me about the song. How do you even get Wretch on the song? Let's talk about that song and we'll talk about UK music for a little bit. Yeah, man. Um, so a Ghanaian producer called Chris sends me beats all the time, yeah? Yeah. And then I was just flicking through his beats and then I heard this, like the strings, yeah? And the sample. And I was like, yo, this sounds wavy. So I said, bro, I like the song. Do you mind if I send it to a couple people to check it over? So I sent it to Comens. He added the drums. I sent it to Jimmy James. He fixed up the strings and brought it forward. And then I put the bars down. And then my friend, Tenny Tinks, sung the hook. Mm. And then, bro, the track was sounding so sick, yeah. And I was like, the only person I could hear on this song is Rich. But I know mm. he's not going to do it. Because if you know Rich, yeah, like, he's selective, bro. Like, he only really works with the man them. Yeah. And <laughs> he only does it if he really feels the music. You get me? Mm-hmm. Um so we followed each other for a while. We speak a little bit here and there. So I just sent him a voice note. And I said, yo, bro, I know you're selective, bro, but I think I've got one, man. <laughs> so I think I've got one. Then he was like, say nothing. Send me the tune, yeah? So I sent him the tune. He emailed me back straight away. He said, bro, this is mad. Recorded yeah. his verse a couple of weeks after. Bro, when I got his verse, I was sitting in my living room sofa. Bearing in mind, I grew up on Rich, innit? Mm-hmm. Of course. I heard the verse, yeah? And I thought, I just sat in silence for like 10 minutes, bro. I was just like this for 10 minutes. Because <laughs> it, it was a sick verse, bro. And I was like, yo, this is what this song needs. And yeah, this is going to be like the single off the back of that album, man. Nice, man. Now, that is definitely a big look. In your career, how many like mainstream black artists have reached out to you? And how many almost on the tunes have we had? What's that re- um, relationship with you like? It's good, man. I don't want to name drop, but there's a yeah. lot of artists that I speak to just on the DMs and stuff. But, um, and this is no shade to any artist or whatever. I feel like artists are so protective over their career, especially mm. if that, they're at a certain point. So even if I'm like, let's do a tune, they'll be on it because they like what I stand for. And they yeah. like the conversations we have a sick or whatever. But then they're like, hey, I'm going to run, you know. I don't know if doing mm. a tune with Governor B is the right thing. Um, yeah. So I get it from that perspective because you've got, like, management, you've got blah, blah, blah. But for me, I don't really mind that because I think relationship is important, man. And I just, I'm just happy that, like, artists, whoever you are, man, mainstream, not mainstream, big, not big, feel like they can hit me up in the DMs and, like, get me to pray for them or ask me advice or whatever, man. So definitely feel like God's got me in this position for a reason. And then on the flip side of that, when you see, like, a Kanye West ultralight beam... Or Stormzy hmm. Blinded by Your Grace, for example. Do you ever think, like, oh, I could have had a piece of that. Like, someone could have shouted me. I'm just saying. Do you know what I mean? Nah, I don't, you know. Because I know that if I recorded Blinded by Your Grace, Grace, that's a brace, you know. It's not going <laughs> to it's not gonna do what Stormzy did with it. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. I'm in my lane, man. And if anything, I'm thankful. Because I genuinely think Chance the Rapper, Kendrick, Stormzy doing the songs that they're doing open the door for me even, even more because now 
One extra can't tell me, oh, we're not going to play it because it's too, like, safe face. I'm like, bruv, look at your playlist, bro. Blinded by Grace yeah. is there. You get me? Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think they opened the door a little bit. So, I think all things work together. I think it opened the door, man, if I'm yes. being honest. Um, and I know a few artists that have been doing faith based music was like, ah, see, we've been doing this for, like, years, and now them man do it. And, but I'm like, bro, like, if you were really doing it for the right reasons, you shouldn't really care, man. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It shouldn't, it shouldn't really matter. That's very true, you know. That's what happens when you stand for a purpose in your music so that's beyond you. Yeah, yeah, 100, man. 100. What do you like about singing? <laughs> Are you trying to blame me, bro? No, I'm asking the question. <laughs> nah, just all my influences, bro. When you're growing up on, like, Motown and, and gospel, when Kurt Franklin is just, like, his songs are just inspiring you on a mad one, you think, you know what, let me push the boundaries out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but I can't lie, the way you asked me that question, I felt like you was being cheeky, bro. No, I wasn't being cheeky. I like the song, innit? I like the song. But I wanted to know, maybe there's a different sort of emotion you can convey when you sing this. Like <laughs> I, just, I just like it, bro. I just like what hearing a song with melody does to people. I like the way it moves people's emotions and stuff. Granted, I maybe not always have the strongest voice to do it, but I feel like the vulnerability in my music means a lot man that's why cast your cares was so successful you know what i mean i'm not the best singer yeah. but i think it just connected because people can hear the realness do you know what i'm saying very powerful man very powerful you know right, so mean? put it like this you think i should sing on my next album yeah of course yeah, uh, my, guy. Cast your my, cares. Guy. Yeah. my guy my guy my guy <laughs> give us a vocal man we we'll love it we'll love it <laughs> how do you feel in terms of the evolution of the christian rapper in worship and gospel music um yeah i think it's good man i feel like obviously generations have changed when you hear a gospel artist you might think kumbaya my lord or like white robe choir sister act do you know what i'm saying mm. but i feel like now it's just got to be relatable do you know what i mean if you're having someone singing a song and then someone comes up and does a rap verse, I think that's another door open for that person that might be into rap music, but feels like church or gospel music ain't really got nothing for them. So yeah. one of my biggest inspirations is Kurt Franklin, because when Kurt Franklin did Stomp, he got a lot of stones thrown at him because it's not really what a gospel tune should sound like, but he helped push the genre mm. forward a lot and that's always going to have an influence. On a side note, yeah, do you ever get opposition for your lyrics? Like the Bible scholars, they ever come to you? <clears throat> nah, not really, you know. One time, one guy on my daily duppy, yeah, said that he's going to put a, like a letter bomb through my door, bruv. Oh. Yeah, it was <laughs> mad. <laughs> Why? Well, I had a bar that he misheard. So I had a bar because, um, like, pray for ISIS, pray for blah, blah. Everyone's, I can't even remember the bar. But he mm. basically thought I was bigging up ISIS. And oh. That wasn't what I was doing at all. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's a mad yeah, reaction, man. though. Yeah, man, it's a letter bomb, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Kumbaya, your friend Barney Artist. <coughs> I've seen Barney in the comments and that. Yeah. What was that like? What's it like collaborating with your friends? Yeah, it's good, man. Like, obviously, Barney's done well the last few years. The years before that, we didn't really know how it would work out with him. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> It was touch and go for a while, <laughs> but but the rebrand was the rebrand was strong, um, and I wasn't actually going to use that beat. So Jimmy James is a guy that produces my whole most of my album, yeah, and yeah. he's done it for the last few. He produced Kingdom Skank as well, and he played that oh, beat from and, all the way back then. Yeah, from all the way back, man. Mm. Um, and he played that beat, and I wasn't really feeling it, not because it wasn't a good beat, but it just didn't connect. So um, I sent it to the man then because I needed another tune for the album. And then Barney was like, this is flipping sick, yeah? And then me so and Barney right up his street. Yeah, right up his street. You would think. Yeah. But I said, Barney, you only do tunes with Tom Misha and Jordan <laughs> Mackay and, and them man, yeah? You wouldn't do a tune with me. And then I feel like it touched him, innit? And he was like, yeah, true, that's my boy. Let me hop on. So he wrote his bars, like, as soon as you heard the beat. Half an hour later, he sent me a voice note and he was sick. Um which is a first for him. Um, mm. So, yeah, man. <laughs> I just thought, yeah, let's do it. That's sick, man. Another big life event that you've gone through, having your first child. 
Yeah, man. That's my G. Talk to, talk to me about that, man. Yeah, so his name's Ezra, um, and that was massive for me. I didn't really care if I had a boy or girl, yeah. but the fact I had a boy, I realised meant a lot because obviously he carries my surname, and that's my dad's surname. So I mm. felt like my dad departed, and Ezra's here to continue the legacy kind of thing. So that means a lot for for me. And it just gave me another sense of purpose. Every time I leave the house, I'm like, bro, man, I got a son that I have to provide for and be an example to. And yeah, man, it's crazy. And the way that I love him is mad, bro. It's just a different kind of love, bro. He's in the battle video as well. Does it inspire new sounds for you, having a child? Yeah, definitely. Obviously, man, I have to get them in the videos and that because I realise the gal them like, like the cuteness. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to get them views up. Um... <laughs> But yeah, I don't know about new sounds, but content, 100%, man. I'm like, this thing can't be a joke. I can't leave my house and leave my son, go studio to just chill, bro. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I have yeah, to yeah. come out with bangers, bro. So, yeah, man. He's definitely and before, made a impact. So at the start, it was like, if it don't bang, it's you on the streets. Then it's you and your wife on the streets. Now it's you and your wife. Right now, shit. if it don't bang, bro, it's sticky, bro. <laughs> Social services are coming for me, you know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. It has to. But you see me, yeah? Like, when Ezra was here, I clocked. I'm not defined by being a music artist. So mm -hmm. if tomorrow... See, yeah, this COVID-19 thing has just cancelled my summer. Summer, yeah. Um, I'm like, all right, cool, man. Let's just roll with it. But if next year something happens and I can't make music anymore, I will be pulling up to your yard in an Uber Eats yes. car, brother. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Doing what I have to do for the family. And that's no disrespect to anyone that works at Uber Eats. They got Uber Eats, but... I would do anything, bro, to provide, man. It doesn't just have to be music. Like, I'll go McDonald's. I'll do whatever, bro. I'll clean the streets. You get me? Do whatever it needs to be done. Yeah. Nah, I hear that, man. One of my favourites on the album, These Are The Days. Yeah. How did you feel bringing that joy to the album, sort of thing, in terms of where you, your journey you've been on, yeah. where you're at today? What was that like? Yeah, it feels great. I mean, the theme of the song is even on the darkest days, there's something I can be grateful for. So when I'm feeling down and depressed, I can say, yo, my son, man, like, he's here. I'm thankful for that. Or I could say my mom, I'm thankful for her, or my brother. Um, but, like, yeah, bro, I just wanted to put that across in the music. And Ezra Collective, I've been a fan of for ages. I love live music. Whenever I do a headline show, most of the times I'm using a live band. Um, mm -hmm. And they killed it, bro. And... Yeah, man. Like, the sun was out a couple of weeks ago. Or was it last week on the weekend? And I was playing the tune. And I was like, bro, this is exactly what I wanted the tune to do. This is perfect, bro. Mm. So I think when lockdown's done, I'm going to make some noise about that song, man. Because I love it. It's special for me. I think you should, man. Hopefully we can salvage some of the summer, man. 100%, bro. I'm What's your favourite song on the album? Changes all the time. But the one I've been banging, weirdly enough, a lot. This week is the last song, Everywhere and Nowhere. That oh, I yeah. So I just love the beat and I feel like I'm spitting about my journey so far and my hope for the future. Um, so yeah, I like that song a lot, man. I think Johnny in the comments wants to play you on FIFA or something. Yeah, I, I can't that. lie, bro. I stopped, I stopped the FIFA thing, man. <laughs> you stopped? You stopped? Yeah, I kept getting smacked up by these 12-year-olds online, bro. <laughs> hey, one, the other day, yeah? No, this one the other day. This was a while ago. Yeah. How can I be beating someone too and all, yeah? And you know you can send messages and that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then they told me suck my mum. Oh, and then logged off, bro. Yeah. <laughs> That's when I said, yo, FIFA online's not for me, bro. I'll it's just play when much. the man them come round. It's too much. You know the insults I get on FIFA? Like, I can't <laughs> believe it. It's crazy, bro. And then you can't even do nothing because they've logged right. off. Do you know what's even worse? I play NBA 2K and people have headsets in it. So yeah. when you're playing, they have headsets. They'll just be cussing you, cussing you. <laughs> they come out of my nah. TV. I have to mute my TV. <laughs> nah, I, can't, I can't do the headset thing, bro. I'm not going to lie. Because I, I, get, I get upset easily, innit? Okay. I'll start searching for your IP address and that, bro. <laughs> Goodness. As you said, man, summer's a little bit sticky because of everything that's going on. Hmm. But what's next for you? What's moving forward? How are we going to take this album? Do you know what's crazy? Like, I actually don't know, bro. Like, I'm just feeding off everything organically. So, for example, these are the days I'm connecting. So I'm probably going to do something with that. Or mm. Fall On Me With Wretch is doing really, really well. So I'm going to think of ideas around that. But I've actually been reading this book lately. 
um, called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, yeah? And it just really spoke to me because I'm the kind of person that needs... To you got another one coming. What's the book process for you? How does that work? One needs to have a plan, like... Do you know what I mean? It's like 10 years and I've got like nearly 10 projects. Like, it's crazy. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, so I just feel like I want to chill, like, after the album campaign. And I just want to, like, just see what happens, bro, man. And not always feel the need to be on to the next thing. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be ungrateful for the position God's put me in. Like, I'm going to use that to my advantage and keep the momentum going and keep putting up music. But in terms of having a solid plan, I'm just going to kick back, man, and wait and see. Yeah, no, it makes sense. It makes sense, mm. man. That is sounding correct. But we didn't even talk about books. Yeah, I got another one coming, culture. man. Yeah, so our popular yeah. culture is out. And you got another one coming. What's the book process for you? How does that work? Uh, so unpopular culture it took me about a year to write. That was like 2017, I think. And that's mm -hmm. basically my story. And the reason I wrote that is because my primary school teacher told me that I was always gifted at writing. And I just remember going into the library at primary school and you had to pick out a book. And bare the books I just thought were dead, bruv. And I would always <laughs> pick out uh, Benjamin Zephaniah books or like, you, do you remember GCSE Anthology? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. There yeah, was yeah. like um, that poem, Half Cast and that. And I'll just be yeah. reading the poems and that, yeah. Um, and then I thought, I want to write a book that young people can just like pick up in the library and be proud of. So that was Unpopular Culture. And this next one that I'm writing, um, called Unspoken, The Man Within the Man, is all about how toxic masculinity can affect how we process our grief. So, for example, in the ends that I grew up in Cannon Town, one of my boys has been stabbed to death. You just expect life to go on, but it doesn't have to be like that. You've got to deal with that, man, because that's probably affected you in some way, shape or form. Or if you lost a parent or like you said that you sadly lost your sister, how are we processing that in the right way so it doesn't like affect us in a negative way long term? Mm. So yeah, man. So that's the next one. When does that come out? Uh that's out in October. In October. Okay. Yeah. okay. So there's something in the pipeline there, man. Yeah, something there's coming. Something in the pipeline. There's something in the pipeline. Bro, it's been good. It's been good chatting. No, Very thank nice you for doing up, this man. as well, bro, man. Like I listen to your show a lot. I think it's sick what you're doing. You're do that you. new thing you're doing as well of um, playing play. artists that haven't been played on national radio before, I think is sick, bro. Because I think a lot of artists think that they have to get like a radio plugger or they have to jump through a lot of hoops. So mm. what you're doing is wicked, bro, with a homegrown thing, man. No, thank you very much. That first play, literally inbox straight to radio, man. If the song's good. Yeah, so it's so that's good. hard. And from my knowledge, not a lot of people are doing that. So, yeah, big ups to you. Yeah, thank you very much, man. Thank you very much. What I might, even, I might even send you. A, I might even send you an email for first play, bro. <laughs> You've had your radio <laughs> play, man. You've had it. You've had it. Playlists and that. We see it. Come on. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Matt said Robert's got to go to bed. I'm not a small boy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> man, I, I can stay up. Man. Yeah, I can stay up past midnight if I want to. <laughs> 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 Oh, bro, yeah, man. words of wisdom. Leave us with something before we go, man. I don't that know, we can bro. take into our week. The only thing I'd say right now is there's no need to be in a rush to be the best version of yourself. Just like take your time, try to be better than yesterday, and just don't compare yourself to other people because you're running your own journey. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, I feel like the culture that we're in is like we're always in a rush, we're always running. And I've got caught up in that. But I'm just saying, and this whole situation that we're in has spoke to me a lot. My whole summer's cancelled, but I'm all right, bro. Like, mm. God's looking after me. Do you know what I'm saying? And we'll survive this, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, don't be afraid to, like, say no to stuff. Don't be afraid to not um, do what everyone else is doing. Just run your own path. Take your time and give it all you've got, man. We hear that. We hear that. Thank you very much, Governor Beef. He's in the studio. I'll give you a round of applause. Love, bro. I really appreciate it, man. No problem. Everywhere, nowhere, out now. Check it. Yeah. Go listen to what I'm looking for on the narrow road as well. Right, Rob, stop misbehaving, bro. Seriously. <laughs> <Cheers, man. laughs> I'm going to cook my pepper soup now anyway. And then yes, please. Say, say nothing. All right, then. Peace, man. Love you. Peace, man. All right.